I'm certain that uh, the, the opportunity exists for members of the Senate, our staff to have uh, briefings and education on the Down syndrome issues. And we decided that uh, we would we titled today's gathering, Scientific Advances in Down Syndrome Research, What It Means for Cancer, Immune Disorders, Alzheimer's Disease, and Beyond. Uh, I, I would guess that whether that title is accurate or not all depends upon what these individuals uh, ultimately say. But um, I, I've been engaged in this issue for most of my time in the Senate, and I want to make sure that uh, it is not just a cursory thing in, in me and my staff's world, and give other members of the Senate the opportunity to engage on this topic. Um, a very special welcome to our participants. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing your expertise and your personal experiences with Down syndrome. Um, I'm a Senate appropriator, uh, including Labor HHS subcommittee, and we get lots of requests for uh, ways to spend money. Uh, it is pleasing to me that NIH has been a beneficiary of many of those decisions and uh, I hope that's uh, true into the future. Uh, it is difficult to decide how we are going to pay and what has priority, how money can best be utilized, but I am convinced that uh, federal funding, uh, private funding for medical research is one of the investments that the country will see incredible returns for, uh, both individually and as an economy, uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation, and really in the world. Um, so I'm pleased that you're here uh, let me just introduce our participants and get right to the, to the conversation. Uh, Dr. Diana uh, Bianchi is a shortened version, so I'm going to my version. Uh, is, as soon as I find the page, I'll tell you what it follows the is. Uh, oversees an annual budget of about $1.6 billion in support of NIC's HD's mission to lead research and training to understand human development improve reproductive health, and enhance, benefit, enhance the lives of children and adolescents. Dr. Bianchi received her MD from Stanford University of Medicine and her postgraduate training in pediatrics, medical genetic, uh, genetics, and neonatal, prenatal medicine at Boston Children Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Dr. Joaquin Espinoza is the Executive Director for Science at the Linda Cernick, Kernick uh, Institute for Down Syndrome. He's a professor in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Colorado Denver School of Medicine co-leader of the Molecular Oncology Program at the University of Colorado Cancer Center and the founding director of Functional Genomics Facility at the University of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Espinoza obtained his PhD from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina and did postdoctoral study at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in California. And Michael C. Witten is the president and CEO of Global Down Syndrome Foundation. She co-founded the organization in 2009 after giving birth to her daughter, Sophia, who happens to have Down syndrome. Global has become the largest nonprofit in the United States working to save lives dramatically, uh, improve healthcare outcomes for people with Down syndrome. Global is the largest funder of Down syndrome research and medical care after the federal government. And uh, Frank Stevens is an active spokesman for the Global Down Syndrome Foundation and the recipient of Global's highest honor, the Quincy Jones Exceptional Advocacy Award he is also a longtime member of the Board of Directors of Special Olympics in Virginia. An accomplished public speaker, Frank has invited all over North America and Europe to promote inclusion for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Frank's articles appear in many publications. He's contributed to the Amazon bestseller, Stand Up, which features short stories of outstanding young advocates. I, again, welcome you all. And uh, I think we start with, uh, let me look at my notes, but I think we start with uh, Dr. Bianchi. Unless you want to do it differently. That's not what it says here, but I'm happy. Oh, you're right. It doesn't say that here either. Uh, However you prefer. Chelsea Witt. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it does say that here. Yeah, I can do. Uh, Frank and I are going to do some welcoming remarks before we get into the, the heavy, nitty gritty uh, science that is uh, transforming and saving the lives of people with Down syndrome. Um, I think um, some of you may know my personal story. Um, I had a prenatal diagnosis and I'm a little bit type A, so I started reading about Down syndrome and I found like the 1983 paper on Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. I also found research 
um, saying that people with Down syndrome, uh, it's very rare for them to get solid tumors. And then because after Sophia was born, there were a lot of medical issues, um, I started looking for some answers. And I flew in 2004 and 2006 to the NIH and I met with Dr. Elias Zerhouni, who at the time pulled numbers and said, hey, you're the least funded genetic condition by the NIH. If you're gonna do one thing, go back and create an institute. Um, you know, being half Chinese and half Italian, the, the Italian side was very upset at the disparity and the Chinese side was like more like, oh yeah, let's just go create an institute. And so um, we created Global Down Syndrome Foundation with an affiliate model. So we provided the seed funding for the Cernic Institute, for the C-Center for Down Syndrome at Children's Hospital, which is now the largest in the U.S. with over 2,200 unique patients, as well as an adult clinic at Denver Health. Um, we're very proud of our work, uh, never a forest without us. Um, Frank is also a board member of Global, and we have many, we have thousands of people with Down syndrome who inform by focus group and survey our resources. Um, one of the most proud things that we've done um, is uh, organize, um, or help organize the first ever uh, congressional hearing to labor HHS on the House side, uh, the Appropriations Subcommittee. And it was very exciting for us to be able to talk about the lack of funding and yet this idea that you have 400 <coughs> plus thousand people walking around, we're gonna get Alzheimer's but not get solid tumors and don't they deserve something and then couldn't we then help a whole bunch of other people. So I feel like very fortunate and I see my colleagues from NDSS and NDSC, I think when it comes to certain areas and, and people with Down syndrome, not just the research part, we get to see a different kind of government. We get to see Republicans and Democrats working together. So thank you very much, Senator Moran, uh, who also is a Quincy Jones Exceptional Advocacy Award winner. Thank you very much. Um, so it's just, it was very proud, a proud moment for us to have that hearing and then see, uh, as a result, wonderful things happen at the NIH. And to this day, Frank's five minute testimony has had over 200 million views. So that just kind of tells you something about that inspirational moment. We also created the first ever medical care adult guidelines. Um, and that was very important to us because the average lifespan was 28 uh, for people with Down syndrome in the 1980s and now it's 60. I do want to highlight that the average lifespan, according to a couple of publications for an African-American or a black person with Down syndrome is 36. So I'm hoping you know, with our colleagues and with NIH we can address that issue. So you know, that's pretty much me and I would love to, um, uh, of course, you know, uh, I wanna thank also Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Bianchi and uh, Frank for being here and the people in the audience, um, thank you so much. Um, but I think Frank has a few words uh, to say as well. And again, um, we, I don't think we would even be here without him. On behalf, uh, first, on behalf of the half a million Americans with an extra chromosome, I want to thank Senators Moran and Casey for caring enough to make this 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 briefing happen, and a huge thank you to Michelle and we're both were constantly putting us out front to be seen and heard. Finally, thanks to Dr. Bianchi and Dr. Espinoza and their work and for being here today to explain it. That is all I was Assigned to do today, but I, 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 but I have the mic. <laughs> so I am going to say at least a, a, a few words. I am Frank Stephen. I, I am a man with Down syndrome, and my life is worth living.
that that is the, the, the beginning of a speech idea that lasts about an hour. Don't worry, as Taylor Swift says to every new boyfriend, I will be keeping you long. <laughs> I just want to remind you why we, we are here. I, I, I am a member of, of a cohort that contains the most people with a genetic anomaly that, that receives the least research funding that needs to change. The research programs that doctors Bianchi and Espinoza will tell you about, will explain why. That is so important. I am here to put a face on that why. My friends and I are ready to be a part of the necessary research to change our lives and yours. I just, as, as just one example, we can eliminate Alzheimer's disease in our lifetime. None of you here today needs to live out your lives growing more childlike and helpless with each passing day the way my mother is. We are close. We are very close. This is something that, they, that, that, that you can be proud of, that you did while, you, while you, you were here. Let's get this done. Thank you. Well, thank you, Frank. You've truly been transformational. I didn't attend that 2017 House hearing, uh, but I've seen it on YouTube. And I think it was one of the few, if not the only time, that someone got a standing ovation at a house hearing. So congratulations on that. And you can, in the material that we brought, you can see the difference in funding. So after Frank's incredible testimony, it really pivoted the funding for Down syndrome, which has made an amazing difference. And um, we knew that there was going to be new funding for Down syndrome. It's not that NIH didn't have funding for Down syndrome. There was minimal funding for Down syndrome. And I know that from personal experience because prior to NIH, I was a professor at Tufts Medical School doing research on Down syndrome. And it was really hard to get the grant funded. After 2018, it changed with the development of the INCLUDE program. So INCLUDE is really a pun. It is meant to give the message that we need to include people who have Down syndrome in research. They shouldn't be excluded from research. But it's also an acronym that stands for Investigation of Co-Occurring Conditions Across the Lifespan to Understand Down Syndrome. And that's important because there are certain conditions that people with Down syndrome are much more predisposed to, like Alzheimer's. Uh, on the other hand, they're somewhat protected from solid tumors or myocardial infarctions. Why is that? That's one of the goals. And if we can understand the differences, then we can also benefit people who don't have Down syndrome. So we, I, I remember very well, because it was around Easter time where we spent the Easter weekend talking about how are we going to conceive this program, which is a, an NIH-wide program. So 19 of the 27 institutes and centers currently participate in this. So you have expertise um, from the Deafness Institute on how do you develop better hearing aids for people with Down syndrome, for example. 
we, we decided that there were three major needs. One was that there was a need for transformational basic science research that would either develop new animal models or understand uh, if you could silence the extra chromosome 21, what would that do in the cell model? And I assume that Joaquin is going to talk a little bit about some of the basic science discoveries, particularly the work of his group in terms of the immune system and what's different about the immune system in people with Down syndrome. But the exclusion of people with Down syndrome from research really needed to be tackled. And so the second aim was to encourage investigators to work together and develop cohorts. How, you know, in an individual clinic, you might have 100 or 200 people that you're, you are both treating and studying with Down syndrome, but now we have over 6,000 people who are all together because of the funding. And so that brings a lot more power to the science in terms of the studies. And then the third thing gets back to include which is include people with Down syndrome in existing clinical trials. Like I said, previously they were excluded. So medications, for example, because of the differences in people with Down syndrome, differences in their metabolism, differences in their immune systems, we might be offering Frank a medication that hasn't been specifically tested for people with Down syndrome. We need to do that, so we are giving them safe and effective medications. So I don't want to take up too much time, but I can give you, with, you know, if you're interested in more details, some of the drugs that we're testing in both children and adults. So whether it's children who have Down syndrome and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, or whether it's adults with Alzheimer's, why aren't they included in some of these clinical trials? So we're making a lot of progress there. The other thing, as uh, Michelle referenced, is we need to focus on diversity. We need to understand why uh, people who are white are living much longer with Down syndrome, but people of other races are not. So what is it? Is it biology? Is it stress? Is it lack of access to care? What counts for the health disparities? And we have a number of new grant uh, opportunities that are available for that. And the very last thing, because I thought about this in a way that it would pivot very nicely to Joaquin, is we want to increase the workforce. So when I was a principal investigator at Tufts, I had a really hard time convincing my trainees to stay in the field because they said there was no funding, they weren't sure if they would have a secure career. Well, I'm very happy to say that because of Include, it's quite different now. And um, we have funded a number of activities. Um, the 27 trainees have received support from the Include initiative. I met a number of the fabulous people from Colorado at the Trisomy 21 Research Society meeting. They're very energetic, they're very committed. We also had an in-person immersive summer course for graduate students and postdoctoral fellows to encourage them to get into Down syndrome research. And our research plan um, from fiscal year 22 is very focused on expanding the pipeline for early stage investigators. So that's just an overview. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Espinosa. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, Frank, and Diana for the great remarks. And I'm gonna expand on some of the key points that have been made. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting inviting us today. Yes, um, very important for us to come back and report to you on some of the activities that are taking place. Um, I come to you with a equal parts of gratitude and also anticipation and excitement. Gratitude for everything that has happened already in the past five years, thanks to the increased funding through the INCLUDE project, but also great excitement about what could happen if we stick to it, if we continue to invest in this very important area of research. I want to expand or something that Dr. Bianchi mentioned that is very special about the study of Down syndrome that is not applicable to the study of other conditions. People with Down syndrome are very special. You see, we have all 46 chromosomes. Our DNA is packaged into 46 chromosomes. We get 23 from mom, 23 from dad. 
People with Down syndrome have 47 chromosomes. That is unusual in nature. They get an extra copy of that small chromosome called chromosome 21, three instead of two. That's why the condition is also known as trisomy 21. And what that does, it changes their genetic makeup in a, in a way that is fascinating. As Dr. Bianchi was explaining, now for the first time in history, we can study thousands, perhaps millions of adults with Down syndrome. We didn't have that in the 80s or earlier when the life expectancy was very short. Now that they live longer, we can study them. And we see this remarkable observation. They are protected from solid malignancies. It's very rare to hear of a, of a man like um, Frank to be affected by prostate cancer, for example. Very rare to hear of an adult woman with Down syndrome to be affected by breast cancer. Myocardial infarction, one of the top killers of uh, US Americans, very um, low risk in Down syndrome. On the other hand, it was also mentioned, they are the largest human population with a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's disease, one of the most devastating conditions affecting the, American, the elder Americans today. Uh, they are also and more predisposed to a number of autoimmune conditions. These are conditions where the immune system makes a mistake and starts attacking healthy parts of the body. And recently, very important to this time and age, we learned that there are a very high risk of severe COVID-19. So individuals with Down syndrome are 10 times more likely to be hospitalized and then in the hospital to have severe consequences of COVID-19. So something that is key to the INCLUDE project is that, of course, we want to pay attention to individuals with Down syndrome first and foremost, but if we do a good job, we will learn things about human biology that affect all of us. So this opportunity for broader impacts is not obvious in other areas of medical research, but it's very obvious in the study of Down syndrome. So I'd like to give you one example that hopefully will also demonstrate the value of the great strategy from NIH in these three areas of investment. As Dr. Bianchi explained, component one, basic science, things that are done in the lab that may or may not have a, a, an obvious application. Number two, cohort studies. We need to study people with Down syndrome. We need to catch up and reverse that historical neglect. And then number three, clinical trials. We need to start testing new medicines in people with Down syndrome. So here's my, my example. We did a basic study using blood samples from a cohort study that we have at the University of Colorado called the Human Trisome Project. We took hundreds of samples of individuals with Down syndrome and did a number of unbiased analyses. We didn't have a hypothesis in mind. We compared the blood to the blood of typical people of the same age and sex. And then we asked the computer algorithms to tell us, what does it look like? What is this blood looking like? And the answer was very obvious. The blood of a person with Down syndrome looks like the blood of a person, a typical person in the hospital with COVID-19. Let me say that again. The blood of people with Down syndrome looks like the blood of a person fighting a viral infection. Imagine that, that you have an extra chromosome and somehow your immune system is tricked into thinking that you should be fighting a virus 24 seven. That's gonna cause a lot of issues. So we did more research on it through the cohort study on Fund 2 uh, and identify the possibility of repurposing FDA-approved drugs, drugs that are used to treat auto-inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, like psoriatic arthritis, use those medicines in people with Down syndrome to normalize the immune system. And here's where component three <coughs> comes into the picture. We include funding, we launch a clinical trial exclusively for individuals with Down syndrome using a medicine that was FDA-approved for rheumatoid arthritis to see if we could normalize the immune system and monitor what the benefits could be. So we had a couple of ideas about what the benefits could be. It turns out that more than half of adults with Down syndrome have autoimmune thyroid disease. What is that? It's your immune system attacking your thyroid gland to the point that it shrinks and it stops producing the thyroid hormone that is bad for you. Your metabolism, your growth is impacted by that. 25% of adults with Down syndrome have been diagnosed with one or more autoimmune skin conditions, things like psoriasis, for example, you may be familiar with that. alopecia areata, where the immune system attacks the hair follicle on your hair, falls off, atopic dermatitis or eczema, and many others. 
So we said, okay, let's put in people with alcinum into the trial that had one or more of these autoimmune skin conditions. And the results were remarkable. Let me tell you, one person of the many that participated in the trial, a young man, 17 years old from Texas, he flew with the family to Denver to participate in the trial. He had no hair whatsoever. He couldn't see any hair in his scalp. Within four months of taking the medicine, a big red hairdo, you know, and he's been telling us, uh, that, why is that? Because the new system is turning down, he's letting out the hair follicle uh, grow the hair. All along, he's been telling us that his friends call him Ed Sheeran, like the <laughs> British singer. And we're like, well, we don't see the similarity. But then when the hair came out, you know, he's a redhead, yeah, he looks like Ed Sheeran. So while studying uh, these participants, we notice in some of them improvements in neurological function, especially participants that have a condition known as regression. These are young individuals with Down syndrome that are doing well, are going to school, uh, are holding a job, and then something happens, and they regress. They lose the skills, they lose the speech, they, they withdraw into their rooms, they, they cannot dress themselves. It's called Down syndrome regression disorder. We had two participants with that condition that did remarkably well. So this made us think that perhaps that regression event is driven by an immune trigger. Maybe they were exposed to a virus or they had a, a stressful event in their lives, the immune system attacked their brains. So now, what do you know now? We start a second trial, now not for the skin, but for the regression condition, testing the immune agent along with psychiatric medicines to compare what is the medicine that's gonna make the most impact. Regression. So that shows you have a basic science experiment, looking at the blood without any hypothesis in mind, through a cohort study, the Human Trisome Project, leading to clinical trials that are research intensive. So you not only test the medicine, but you will study the participants as they take the medicine. You learn new things that lead to the second clinical trial. So I want to commend NIH for this structure, you know, of the three components that feed off each other, you know, and create this synergy uh, in the study. So I'm, I'm very, very excited, uh, not only for people with Down syndrome, but also for the implications for the general population. And let me wrap up with this example. When, when COVID-19 arrived to Colorado, we got really worried, because I just told you that we knew at the time that people with Down syndrome have a hyperactive immune system, and that chances were that they were going to overreact while fighting SARS-CoV-2, the COVID virus, and we were correct in that the epidemiological data they confirmed. But here's the good news, because we were working with that medicine, that rheumatoid arthritis medicine, known as a jack inhibitor. We proposed very early on, in March, uh, April of 2020, the early days of the pandemic, these jack inhibitors will help people with COVID-19. Not only people with Down syndrome and COVID-19, but the general population with COVID-19. We published those findings, what do you know today? Jack inhibitors, the medicine that I'm talking about, are FDA approved for the treatment of COVID-19 in the general population. So that shows you how the study of Down syndrome of the immune system not only is helping them, but also has enabled us to make important predictions about the therapies that would uh, prove beneficial in COVID-19, something that has affected us all. So again, a lot of gratitude to Congress, to the advocates, to NIH, and a lot of excitement about the times to come. Thank you. Uh, doctor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, it, uh, it's very pleasing to me, to, me uh, to see that there are consequences to decisions made. Advocates who bring us uh, the insistence that something more be done. Uh, and then uh, NIH having those resources and providing them to others to, and the consequences that occur from that research. And in particular, consequences that occur that are unexpected that end up helping uh, others with a variety of conditions unrelated to, I assume, the original premise uh, of the research. It's a great circle. I have a couple questions, but I, I'd ask the audience uh, if they'd like to ask our panelists any questions or make any suggestions to, uh, not to me, but to them. Please, someone. Yes, ma'am.
So the National Institute on Aging uh, funds a considerable number of grants that are related to aging and Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. I know that there was a lot of controversy about why people with Down syndrome were not included in the Anduhal um, trials, the clinical trials, because that would go counter to what we were trying to promote with INCLUDE. And in fact, we are now funding an investigator who has put together a cohort of 120 people with Down syndrome who have Alzheimer's disease who are going to be tested. The, the reason why they weren't included in the original Aduhelm trials was that um, Aduhelm has a side effect of uh, brain swelling and possibly some vessel damage, and it was felt to be potentially unsafe. We didn't want to uh, cause a stroke in anybody. So they have put together a new cohort, and they tell me that they are going to be testing a new drug for Alzheimer's, again, promoting the principle uh, of INCLUDE for uh, including people with Down syndrome who have clinical trials. I would like to add to that, you know, the, the enormous value of the population with Down syndrome to understand Alzheimer's disease. We have a very good idea why they have more Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is driven by these uh, plaques in the brain, that they are made by a protein, the amyloid precursor protein, that is encoded by a gene on that chromosome 21. So we all have two copies of that amyloid precursor protein gene. People with Alzheimer's have three copies. So that causes an overdose of this amyloid protein that drives the appearance of those plaques. Now the great difficulty in clinical trials of Alzheimer's disease is that it's hard, very hard for us to know who of us is going to get it and when. So how do you do a trial for you know early on to prevent the development of the condition? Very difficult. Um, so you have to wait until some signs show up. And by then the trial is kind of late in the game. You know, you're waiting for a miracle. In people with Down syndrome, knowing that they are likely to get Alzheimer's 20 years earlier, with some variation from person to person, they provide the ideal population to test this concept the lowering the amyloid protein, which is what this medicine Adjuham does, uh, may be beneficial. You don't have to wait until a person like Frank develops symptoms because you know they're more likely to be to develop Alzheimer's. You can start earlier. So we, we really hope that not only NIH fund investigators but also the pharmaceutical industry appreciate the value that I shall uh, spell and you know, that they include people with that syndrome. Uh, and I would just add to that that there are studies looking for biomarkers earlier in life before you become very symptomatic. So the National Institute on Aging is funding a number of studies, as is the um, pharmacology industry, industry um, looking either with imaging studies or looking for specific proteins that are present in the blood or other uh, biofluids. So yeah. you know to predict so that you'll be able to intervene at an earlier time. The other thing I should have mentioned is that we're very focused on shareable data now. So the fact that we, we have created a data hub that just went live in March so that all the people who are contributing, like Frank, who are contributing blood, uh, skin, other specimens, um, as well as their medical information, as well as their imaging information is all being collected. and it will be anonymized and is freely available for other researchers. So as you said, Senator Moran, you know, the excitement is that you don't know what you're gonna find if you're trying to repurpose medications or if you're trying to understand the basic biology. And everybody thinks about the genes that are on chromosome 21, but it turns out that there is either overexpression or underexpression of genes on all of the other chromosomes as well. So in a way, chromosome 21 is influencing the rest of the genome, and that's one of the reasons why it's been so difficult to do studies in this area, because there's so much that is going on. So I want to have something that Dr. Bianchi said about open data, open science framework. This is something that, again, we should commend NIH. I think NIH has learned in other endeavors that sometimes scientists after receiving an age family, we may hold the data or may not fully share it, may take a slice of it, publish it, and hold the rest at the university or center, or what have you. So with the INCLUDE project, 
they created the Include Data Coordinating Center, in which I serve as, as one of the leaders, so that we can create a data hub that we launched in March, so that that is not the case. Data hoarding is not the case. Scientists that receive an NIH grant have an obligation to, soon after they generate the data, to share it, protecting the identity of the research participant, of course, that's not what's shared, is the, the molecular data, the imaging data that is shared. And it's in an online portal that you can access from your phone right now, so that other scientists who didn't generate the data but may have a different idea about how to analyze the data may make extra discoveries. So what that does, it gives you a lot of bang for the buck, right? So you, this person receives the grant for data generation, but then you can give others a grant for data analysis, and that creates collaboration and synergy across the include project. A very, very smart move on the part of the NIH. Others? Uh, yes, ma'am. Second row. Hi, I'm Sarah Harvey here. Hello, uh, Sarah. Nice to see you. Thanks for pulling this together. Um, I wonder if Dr. Bianchi, what the conversations and dialogue with include with NIH have been with CMS? I ask this because I think everyone is absolutely right. We have an access to care issue. We have major health disparities in the down syndrome population. In fact, Senator, I was in Topeka this morning with some of our friends and colleagues uh, talking about the modernization of the IDD waiver in the state of Kansas. We have 5,000 individuals across the state that we know of that are waiting services on a 10-year wait list, which is just frankly unacceptable. Nothing that the great senator can do from, from his vantage point because that funding comes from the state level. But I think the more we get the science in front of the decision and policymakers at CMS, the better we can end some of these ridiculously long wait lists. Yeah, so um, it was really only a few years ago when Dr. Collins was the director that the directors of the NIH institutes met with CMS executives. And um, the focus was really mainly on uh, older adults and uh, less so on children and less so on pregnant people. Um, so I'm not aware of conversations that specifically have to do with care for people with Down syndrome, but that is something certainly that we could bring up at our next executive meeting. Um, with them. I do feel like the research that we're getting from the NIH and from our brilliant scientists is helping us uh, then integrate on the medical side and you know our um, first ever medical care guidelines for adults with Down syndrome. I think there is that effect already happening. So I'm very proud as a parent that I know that we're elongating life and improving health outcomes you know, I'm a bit of a workaholic and I do work a 17 hour day. And, and the reason I do that is because Sophia is one of the first generations who's gonna outlive me. So when I close my eyes, what's gonna happen to her? You know, is she gonna live till 60? That's not my goal. Like, I mean, that's supposed to be high. I want it to be the 70, 80 years old, right? Um, and also is her last 20 years of life gonna be riddled with health issues? So that's why I do it, and I just am so grateful to you, Senator Moran, because really the, the con congressional support for this and you know what we hoped, the therapeutic leverage, which was my dad's architecture, is happening, right? That it, it's, it's not like shooting fish in a barrel, but uh, the number of breakthroughs that have happened in such a short time with this amazing population, first and foremost, to help them us. And secondarily, everybody else uh, is tremendous, and we just couldn't be more grateful and more proud. Yes, and I would just add that, um, again, we're extremely grateful, and I really wanted to emphasize the transformational nature of the funding from Congress. Really, again, there's a, there's a little graph in our handout. You can just see that pivot in 2018, which is clearly um, the appropriations uh, infusion. But we're all about generating data, and data are what CMS needs, the insurers, the blues need that, and they're not going to cover new therapies unless they have objective scientific data. So that's where we play a role, because we can show that
that there are therapies that truly make a difference. And then we can bring it to CMS and say, you've got to cover this. I'm, I'm really pleased from what I've heard so far today. And it is, we have annual hearings in which the, all the directors, of, or nearly all the directors are with us in an appropriations hearing. Uh, we each get about five minutes to have questions and, and return the answers. And it's difficult to cover the gamut of things that you're interested in in that short period of time. And the focus here on Down syndrome and its consequences, and the research consequences to other afflictions and diseases is really important. But I would add just for me and my colleagues, I assume that without exception, at least without any exception that I know of, no member of the United States Senate came here for just purposes of being a United States Senator. They want to accomplish something. And those accomplishments are a challenge to find, to, to, to achieve. And I would say that among the, I don't even know if among is the right word, one of the, I don't even know one of is the right words. This, that, that the occurrences that have, have arrived post the infusion of additional dollars are a tremendous reward uh, and a moment in which we can actually find something where Congress is making a significant difference in this arena. Those moments are too rare in this place, but what I heard today and what I hear from in those hearings is that there is a difference. Uh, and that is something I think 99 other of my colleagues and me are looking for all the time. And so I appreciate the way in which the resources have been used. And I appreciate the advocacy that has increased and the resulting science and medicine that changes people's lives. Uh, I think our goal here in the wide gamut, Down syndrome and other circumstances, is to provide hope that things are going to be different in the future. And uh, none of that happens without what I reached a con conclusion here about is the circle that has taken place with the various roles that each of you play. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted and pleased to hear that uh, perhaps we're increasing hope and in something that uh, all of us uh, who are looking for results uh, can be pleased with. So thank you. Sarah, thank you for your uh, your work in Kansas. I'm delighted that you're here. The, there's a, uh, a lady behind you who also has her, her hand up. <laughs> Hi there, Anna Fiewa from the National Down Syndrome Society. I just first wanted to say thank you all um, for coming to the conversation here. This is really, really important. Um, but I kind of wanted to maybe pivot and ask more of a legislative question. You know, the National Alzheimer's Project NASA is a funding organization for many years. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe touch on the importance of our, you know, the Down Syndrome I think this is the moment that you're lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not familiar with the legislation to, to come on here. So. We'll work with you on that. <laughs> uh, maybe you should lobby us. Yeah. You, you want to give us any, any background? Oh, sure, sure. So, and the Senator is actually a co sponsor, so thank you, Senator. Um, really, just the goal of the NAPA Council or the NAPA Act is to establish the NAPA Council, which kind of oversees a lot of the Searching and programming um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and so just ensuring that the Down syndrome community, you know, has a representation there, and that um, that council and, and that project is able to really understand a lot of what you just shared, and that's why I think kind of including some of these research points and kind of marrying together, right, that research and program um, aspect, because I don't think with Down syndrome or not just being included in the research, but also the programming side of things. You know, we we try uh, in in Congress to not be the determiners of where research dollars go, uh, to not have the, the group that uh, makes the loudest noise or is the most prevalent or comes to Washington, D.C. the most frequently, to make uh, us um, in human nature and otherwise uh, make an adjustment in how we see NIH funding occur. It makes sense to me that science, uh, medicine makes that determination. And it is pleasing every time that you hear there's this combination of benefits that occur uh, between Alzheimer's and, and Down syndrome, and now today other things. 
that, um, again, I think rewards the circumstance in which science leads the direction of NIH. May I add just a little local flavor, just tie together Kansas and Alzheimer's disease. So um, it turns out that Include is funding a uh, grant supplement on the promotion of physical activity for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. So that's going on at the University of Kansas Medical Center right now, and it's looking at the impact of moderate to vigorous physical activity and seeing how activity is affecting cognition and brain health. So we're very excited about that. And um, the other thing I was just gonna mention, which might surprise all of you, is the amyloid precursor protein that Dr. Espinosa mentioned, it's expressed in the placenta. And so babies who are developing in the womb are being exposed to an increased amount of APP. And we don't know what the consequences of that are, but we're really taking a lifespan approach at NIH to look at connections between what's happening during development and what's happening later on in life. So stay tuned on that. Uh, thank you for highlighting what's going on at the University of Kansas uh, Alzheimer's Center. We're very familiar, and they really are focused on lifestyle activities, nutrition, uh, diet and uh, physical uh, engagement. So, thank you. Anyone else? We've heard from the right, at least my right. Do you any from the left? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Recurring. Sleep apnea is very prevalent in people with Down syndrome. Uh, it is recommended, when possible, to do a test for it. You know, it could be a mild form of the sleep apnea, it could be a severe form. And if if it is there, it's important to treat it because imagine you know that you wake up at night multiple times suffocated because you're, you're not getting enough oxygen into your lungs, into your brain. And that happens every night. It's not good for your development. It's not good for your learning. It turns out that we consolidate our memories at night when we sleep. Our brain consolidates what we learn during the day. That um, lack of oxygen triggers inflammation. It, it, it irritates your lungs and triggers inflammation throughout your body. So. Um, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is, plays an important role in the CLUE project, is funding significantly in this area to understand all the impacts of obstructive sleep apnea, sleep apnea in people with syndrome. There are many studies. One of the most difficult things about testing for sleep apnea is that you have to go to a hospital and the person needs to get wired you know, with sensors and spend a night in the hospital, which is difficult. One of the the, the grants from the Include project is funding researchers at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia to see if you will get the same results if you do it at home. The machinery, you know, is not so much as you will get in the hospital, but can you get good results if you do the sleep study at home? That's just one of many studies that the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is funding. So it's a very important co-occurring condition, and the advice is yes to test for it, and there are a number of um, Treatments. And, and the treatments, a big issue is that people who do require the CPAP at night to prevent the sleep apnea, oftentimes uh, the, the masks aren't comfortable, so the child or the adult will pull the mask off, and that defeats the purpose. So there are other uh, therapies that are being explored by some of our grantees. One of them involves uh, stimulating a nerve in the tongue, which is being done in younger children and at least the pilot studies look very promising to help um, move the tongue out of the way so the tongue doesn't block the airway. And in the preliminary results of those studies, they not only found that the sleep apnea was improved, but the children learned better in school. So exactly proving what Dr. Espinosa said, that if you're breathing better, you're getting more oxygen, 
overnight, it helps with your learning as well. I would love to add to that as, as a parent, you know, um, we always look at that 50 to 70 percent have obstructive sleep apnea, which is really quite debilitating. But so much more research, and this goes to Senator Murray and our work, um, needs to be done. Beyond sleep apnea, there's just sleep irregularities, right? My daughter does not have sleep apnea, has been tested several times, and has a lot of uh, sleep problems still. Um, so I think we're just kind of touching the surface. On the one hand, I'm super proud and happy that when my daughter was born, um, their her lifespan was shorter by 10 years. There were no adult guidelines. There wasn't include. We didn't know how to treat some diseases and conditions and people with Down syndrome, and today we do. So like, if you think about the lightning speed of that, but we still got a long ways to go. Um, and so much more to do to get our children the lifespan that they deserve and then the health that they deserve as well. And Ms. Wooten, and, and the fact that it, life, uh, long, that longevity is increasing, the things that you just described that are, are occurring as a result of the research, what it lends itself to is support for additional research, right? Yeah. If you get results, then you, if you're rewarded by the outcomes, then you want to have more outcomes and support grows for medical research to accomplish it. So it, I, if I suggest anything that suggests that we're done, uh, we're not. I, that's a, just another example of the impact, the broader impact of Down syndrome research for the general population. Well, we just explained that if you don't sleep well, you don't learn well. You know, that, that is important for all of us, you know, including the those with our late night owl habits. So who work 17 hours a day. <laughs> For example, <laughs> uh, So, and, and we could go on and on about how every time people with Asian are teachers, they're, they're illuminating, they're showing the way to learn more about, about human biology. I think we're about done, unless somebody has a compulsion. Could I, could I just ask Frank if, if there was anything else that you would like to share with us about research and Down syndrome and what you hope will happen? Yeah. So um, in terms of research and Down syndrome, what, what, what do you hope will happen? What do you want to happen in this area? What do you want for yourself and for other people with Down syndrome? I guess you want to be healthy, but also um, a chance to contribute. That's what you need to do contribute to a great cause by global and also the group project. I don't mean to be one project, but we're just doing very well. That that basically between me and Dr. Eskimo that we're a part of that and, and also what I really want to see happen is to make sure that the, that we get a chance defeat Alzheimer's. Whatever a malady comes our way, we're the team to dig it at that. Thank, thank all of you for joining us uh, today. Uh, thanks for your interest, uh, your uh, boss's interest, your organization's interest in Down syndrome and, and scientific and medical research. And uh, thank you to our, our panel I found very uh, useful to my education and knowledge, so I appreciate it. Uh, I'm reminded that this is the fifth year anniversary of the launch of NIH include, and so uh, I don't know whether this is timely or not, but it's at least momentous, uh, and I'm glad that we're highlighting the success that has occurred and the desire for more to be achieved. And uh, again, thank you for taking the time to join us and for the education that you give me, my colleagues, and I. I thank my, my colleague from Pennsylvania uh, for helping us host uh, this event today and get it done.